A terrible storm hides foreign longships looming at the shore. From them, bearded men armed with spears, axes, and shields invade a Christian monastery. They break the doors, cut down the monks, and steal all the precious metals they can carry. Before the guards arrive, they've set sail. That's a business-as-usual Viking raid during the 6th century when the Vikings terrorized the English kingdoms in search of money and glory. Why were the Vikings so savage at their raids? And what made them so successful? Let's find out today with New Found History. When we say Viking Age, we're talking about the period between the end of the 8th century to the late 11th century in Europe, when Viking technology evolved to new ships with sails, making it easier for them to search faraway lands for riches. Peasant Scandinavians could only obtain privileges by partaking in raids and loot. The more gifts they offered to a chieftain, the higher they'd climb up the social ladder of Scandinavian society. The wealthier the chieftains, the more they rewarded their fighters, making those fighters more loyal and and motivating new recruits to join the chieftain's band, repeating the cycle. So you can imagine the era birthed many a quest for gold and glory on foreign soil. In fact, did you know that the word Viking means raiders? Well, all that led to the first recorded Viking raid in the British land of Northumbria during the spring of 793. The Christian monasteries of the English kingdoms were their first victims, and eventually the Vikings expanded to more raiding campaigns throughout Europe during the late 8th century. Viking raids became a successful enterprise due to the cultural values of the Norse people. There were actually three core beliefs that motivated the raider lifestyle in Viking society. First, early Norse society consisted of minor settlements with barely any central authority and even less law enforcement. That meant people had to settle their disputes independently, always through force. Norsemen held to honor and personal reputation as one of their highest values. So having someone else slander you or spread gossip meant you had to silence them. Norsemen were allowed to attack or even murder each other if they were insulted. In fact, they were expected to do so. Thus, fearlessness prevailed in Viking society. Second, Norsemen believed their time of death was predetermined, but nothing else in life was set in stone. So they developed a dualistic philosophy that could be summarized as that life meant success, fame, or death. Because of the expected fearlessness, thirst for adventure, and cultural violence, Vikings developed tactics that reflected their cultural values. And also, because of the limited central authority, Vikings climbed up in societies by gift-giving and bonding. Some raiders, such as Olaf Tryggvason and Olaf Haraldsson, based their kingship claims on their successful raiding campaigns. The British Isles were the Vikings' most frequent targets, so the English kings ruling the coastal areas labeled them heathens or sea-going pagans. Early raids only involved a couple of ships under the command of chieftains of average power and influence. Then, stronger and more successful chieftains rose to dominance as the raids increased, and so did the ambition of the Viking armies. At first a nuisance, by the time of the attack on the monastery of St. Cuthbert at Lindisfarne in 793, the Vikings were considered evil barbarians due to targeting holy sites. Despite their smaller population, compared to their enemies, the Vikings' warfare tactics gave them an edge over their victims. They never set a battle time and frequented holy sites because they were filled to the brim with gold, precious metals, and Christian relics that they could sell back to other Christian countries for lump sums of gold, as the Christians hated the so-called heathens in possession of their faith's holy relics. At some point, they began sacking the regions they plundered, setting them aflame as part of their terror tactics. No Christian kingdom dared target a monastery, quickly setting the Vikings apart from other Christian European enemies to England. Their raids got so severe that the Vikings were thought to be a punishment from God. So why were these raids so successful? The Vikings were effective precisely because of their alien tactic. European countries didn't know how to deal with their battle strategies. It all starts with the element of surprise. The go-to Viking operation was to literally show up at a town or monastery, get in, loot anything they could snatch, and return to the ships before the local military intervened. Because of this, at first they'd only raid in the summer through hit-and-run tactics. Since most of them were farmers, they had to return to Scandinavia at some 
some point to tend to their crops. Contrary to popular belief, the Vikings didn't want to kill and destroy their enemies mindlessly. All they wanted was an economic benefit. However, in time, they began conquering the lands they ravaged, becoming permanent settlers. They'd lay ambushes and use the woods while waiting for their enemies. Terror tactics played a key role in their strategies. They'd use ransom, extortion, and slave trading to enrich themselves and their community. Their most common weapons were the bow, the axe, and the spear. They had two types of spears, one for thrusting and one for throwing. The axe was their preferred siege weapon, ideal for taking down enemies and their farmhouses. The Vikings specifically targeted those who weren't trained in battle. They knew the advantages of catching their enemies unprepared and relied on those to remove their armed opponents. One of their most famous formations was a shield wall, similar to the testudo employed by Roman legions. The Viking shield wall was difficult to pierce by trained opponents, and for untrained ones it was impenetrable. Yet what made their enemies fear them most of all were the Berserkers. The Berserker Vikings fighting style had warriors employ spirit magic to work themselves into frenzies, like biting the edges of their shields to trigger a hypnotic trance that would make them impervious to injury. They believed wearing bear skins also helped increase their strength, channeling the energy of the animal. The Berserkers ignored all common to time battlefield strategies and instead went, well, berserk, relying entirely on brute strength to pulverize their foes into oblivion. The Berserkers were so feared that Christians called them satanic beasts and any survivor bearing witness to their savagery was quick to spread the word. So what was the secret to the Vikings' success? The Vikings built their ships as sturdy and shallow drafts. This allowed them to sail swiftly up the rivers, get into places other vessels couldn't, and escape the same way they came before their enemies could strike them back. Their ships were so fast that in the sacking of Frisia during the early 9th century, King Charles the Great sent his troops to fend off the Vikings as soon as he heard of their raid. But all they found was the smoldering remains of their attack. On top of that, Viking ships always went in small groups that could go undetected, get into the village, pillage for loot, and leave before any trained army could fend them off. There were reports of larger fleets of over a hundred Viking ships, although usually they were composed of many groups led by different chieftains who united for a common goal and would swiftly disband after their success or failure. That was because the Franks took note of the frequent Viking raids and began paying mercenaries to protect them from the attacks, prompting Viking groups to join forces in response. Viking ships wouldn't fight other other ships directly, but when they were forced to, they'd try to board and seize them instead of sinking them. The Vikings would never let good ships sink on their watch. Viking naval battles were uncommon. No European country or kingdom would dare venture into the frigid waters of Scandinavia, where, if the already advantaged Vikings didn't capture them, the chilling cold would. Most naval Viking battles were actually between themselves, and they only consisted of the fleets lashing their boats together and getting close enough for the fighters to shoot them down with longbows or spears. By 835, Viking attacks had become annual occurrences in England, and by 865, they began collecting tributes in exchange for peace, a false promise as the Vikings continued to raid even after paying the so-called Danageld. Similarly, Viking raids began on the Frankish Empire, plundering every city and town they could reach. On Easter Sunday of 845, they sacked Paris and obligated the Franks to pay them a hefty ransom to leave. Frankish monks described them as an endless stream of heathens massacring, burning, and plundering Christian kingdoms. In 866, the great heathen army, comprised of around two or three thousand Vikings, captured York and placed a puppet king in control of Northumbria. Then they raided other European kingdoms, reaching present-day Russia and most of Eastern Europe. Viking raids provided many members of the Scandinavian farmer class with a chance to prove their worth and earn money for themselves and their village. It was an instrument for social mobility within Norse society. The Vikings had good training, good weapons, and prioritized high mobility with their tactics, making them fearsome foes until the end of the Viking Age, around 1066. What do you think about the Vikings' way of life? Do you think it was better than the Europeans? Tell us what you think in the comments below, and thanks for watching this episode of Newfound History.